starts here in Voorheesville in 1913. They moved from, they were an Italian immigrant family that came from San Marco de Cavolte in Italy. They came originally to Pennsylvania. My first two aunts were born in Pennsylvania in 1913. They moved to Voorheesville and they lived here as a minority community. And uh, eventually my father was born in 1915 on Prospect Street uh, by a midwife. In uh, there was a Italian area down there, um, so that's where my history comes from. Eventually, my grandmother had she was a Ricky. I don't know how much you know about the Rickies. Uh, she was a Ricky. There were at least three of her relatives living in Voorheesville, and my father's Iuliano family had he. My grandfather had two. Um, sisters living in Voorheesville. Voorheesville, the, the actual community of Voorheesville was populated as a result of the railroad, which came in the middle of the 1800s to Voorheesville. Most of the statistical data, dates, and stuff that I will be giving you come from Dennis Sullivan, who is the War Village Historian's book, Voorheesville, a sketch of the beginnings of a 19th century railroad town. Please keep in mind that yes, Voorhees, the, the, what Voorheesville is today was a result of the railroad. Okay, the railroad brought much to the area so that it was populated to the village. An important date that you need to keep in mind is Voorheesville did not become the official incorporated village of Warrisville until 1899. Okay, please keep that in your memory for the tour. Okay. Dennis, is, Dennis wrote this book. Dennis is not a, a native Warrisville, and he came here. He was a professor and a writer, and he wrote this book in 1999 for the 100th anniversary of the village of Warrisville. I have been told by the Historical Society, which is in New, Sa New Scotland Historical Society, which is in New Salem, that this book is available for purchase there uh, in its, I believe it'll be its second edition. I have read this book three times and continue to refer to it. So I uh, suggest if you're really, if you're really interested in the history of Voorheesville, Dennis did a fantastic job uh, with this book. And he still lives here in Voorheesville. You put that in my thank you. Okay, we are standing in what was originally the Terwilliger farm. The, according to evidence Dennis has, the Terwilligers were here in this area in the mid 1700s. Okay, and this was the Terwilliger farm, which eventually turned into the Severson farm, which the um, Senior, um, the senior apartments out here uh, still bear the name of the Seversons. Okay, the Severs, this was a dairy farm and an apple orchard. Okay, back in those days. Okay, across the street is St. Matthew's Church. St. Matthew's Church was this church was built somewhere shortly after 1960 because I was in the first confirmation class here. And I believe that I was confirmed at 12 years old. So I was 12 years old in 62. So the church was here when I was confirmed. This is the second location of St. Matthew's Church. We will also be viewing the first location of the Catholic Church on our tour today. Um, I'm not going to set a high pace, but uh, I'd like to have you try to keep together because I do have, a, I'm very verbose. So I have a lot of things to tell you uh, about. Um, at, the, at the beginnings, I think it's important. In the 1600s, Henry Hudson, came, uh, Henry Hudson came up the Hudson River. There were probably Dutch in this area, okay? We know that in the late 1600s, the English came in and took all of the political power and whatever away from the English or from the Dutch and established an English um, political system here. So this area, I guess, originally 
were settled by probably some Dutch here, but probably predominantly um, English. The religion of this area, I get a lot of my information from my relatives and also from other people that I grew up with here. So maybe some of it isn't perfectly factual, but I sure can tell you the mythology. And uh, this was predominantly a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant neighborhood in the early development of the village. We are going to proceed up the street here and we're going to go, our next stop is going to be at the, um, at the elementary school. We're going to talk about the history of, the short history of the school and the school district and how it became originated. In fact, as we talk about the, the school, one of the first things that we'll, I, found, I find interesting is that when they decided that they needed a school in this area, the people or the fathers that be purchased a one acre piece of land from the two Willigers for $10 an acre. <laughs> Smith, hi Dennis. Good morning, Mr. Campbell. Hello, Dennis. <laughs> Everybody in town knew me and there was no problem with traffic. the history that I ran across uh, in, in, the, in the 1980s, a couple of teachers from the high school decided to do a history of Mooresville, which I have at home and have read. And according to that, there was a school right here was built, again, they were purchased from the Terwilligers an acre of land for $10, and they built a one-room wooden school here on the banks of the Vlai Creek uh, in, 1820, in 1828. I also said, read that in 1824, the school in New Salem was built. That is now the uh, New Scotland Historical Society, so if you know where that is, that school was there. I also have read that in the town of New Scotland, or within the regions of New Scotland, which this was known as before, before it was known as Voorheesville, there were 16 schools, probably, probably elementary, okay, <laughs> probably elementary. As you can see, this was called New Scotland School 10, not Voorheesville yes. School. that at that time there were 48 students. The only the grades only went one through eight. After that you were required to either go to I believe Gilderland Center had a high school and Delmar had a high school or I read that many people went to Albany. How? On the train. Okay. My father um, went one through eight, graduated from the eighth grade here in Morrisville somewhere around 1929. He took the train every morning from Morrisville to Delmar, got off the train and went to Delmar High School. He went to Delmar High School for three years, and in his fourth year when he graduated, his yearbook says Bethlehem Central, so it must have been 1934 that Bethlehem Central became the centralized district. Uh, in 1866, we have a brick building, in 1892, a second room was added to the brick building. In 1911, a third room was added to the brick building. And in 1929, a building plan was developed for this building, which would become the uh, elementary and high school, okay? This building has been added onto uh, twice. It was, it, there's a plaque inside the door on the left that says 1930, so I assume the first class started in 1930 here. The building went, the original building went, this was a state-of-the-art building 
in New York State. It went from here to one room past the central wall, the central head. If the office was up on the third floor, and it's a tiny little office, which we, when I worked here at school, I worked here for 30 years and taught. We call that the uh, penthouse up there. <laughs> uh, it was added on to here once, and they added all kinds of different things down in this area. Then in the 60s, it was added on, they added another room, which we called the new wing, which was, we used, I think it's still used for kindergarten, first and second grades are down in that area. But originally, this was the high school. It only went one through eight at one time, then it got to one through um, uh, 10. I believe 1941 was the first graduating class where they had a, a complete high school, you could get a complete high school education, K through 12. Okay, and that's kind of... They always had kindergarten back then? No. My father, my father always said that he did not speak English until he was, as his first language, or as, until he was six years old. So I'm assuming that that's when he started school here at Warriorsville, when he was probably first grade. Because he said that's when, up to that point, uh, Italian was his first language because he stayed with all his Italian relatives right within the community. We're going to proceed out in this direction. There's another picture you're going to want to take a look at. Um, it could be passed around. One of the big things in Voorheesville was tourism after the trains, and one of the things that was big time was swimming. <laughs> that is a totally wooden bridge, too. Did you see this? Oh, it's okay. Keep going. which brought tourism to Warriorsville, which was called Windle Specks Grove. Windle Windel Specks Grove. Windle Specks Grove was... Is that the name? Is yes. That name? Yes. Okay, I'm going to tell you. The pool was over. They put a concrete dam up. You know how the, the athletic field goes here? It was on the creek on the other end just beyond the uh, athletic field. They dammed that up into a big oval area, which is called Windows Park Grove. There was a pavilion because I broke into it when I was in high school. And uh, we used to go in there. It was, at, at that time in the 60s, it was all shut up and everything was all organized in there. There were chairs and this and that and all this stuff it was all in there the way they had packed it away after the season. And it just sat idle and the dam was no longer in use. But at one point, Windle Specks Grove was a very large swimming area and tourist area in Voorheesville. As you can see from the photograph, don't go without seeing that photograph. Swimming was a big deal around here. There was also Little and Big Falls, which is down farther uh, off of Hilton Road and uh, Normanskill Road. Um, there was a Big Falls there that you could actually see when you go around the bend on Normanskill Road, and um, down farther, there was another swimming area, and there was actually a, uh, a rope swing where you could go out, and I think my father took me down there, and we'd go out on the rope swing and drop, and actually one of my, one of my classmates uh, was paralyzed there because he went out on the thing and landed on some rocks or something. Yeah. So, Windle Specks Grove, access to Dennis's book, my grandfather, Nicola Giuliano, there's a picture of him, but it's very small <laughs> in the book. So. Dennis, when was the pool active and when open? When what was year? it begun? And when was I don't started? know when it was begun. Uh, I assume during the 50s it was big and popular. I got a feeling before the 50s. I think it's I think probably all in the early 1900s, in the early 1900s up until 1960, that that was a Windle Specks Grove was. Did you swim in it? No. It was not, it was not, was it, it wasn't, yeah. So during, it, it closed down somewhere in the 50s. 68, which brings us to kind of the beginnings of Voorheesville. 
a man by the name of Alonzo Voorhees was a lawyer in Albany. He was affiliated with the railroad. The first railroad came through Voorheesville approximately 1863. It went from, a trip went from Albany to Central Bridge out 88. Okay, and I guess they turned around and went back. Uh, apparently, Mr. Voorhees had work through his law firm with the railroad and became tight with them. He came to Voorheesville in 1867 and built a house, which we will see later on in Voorheesville. In Dennis's book, there is a picture of his application. He decided that this area needed a post office. His application is filled out there and in the place that, say, what, that says, what shall this be called? He wrote Voorheesville. <laughs> so that's probably where the name Voorheesville came from. And as a result of the library or the post office, all of the mail said Voorheesville post office on it. So that's probably how it became a change from New Scotland to Voorheesville. However, an important piece of information is that um, even when the train started coming through here originally, the station was known as New Scotland Station. Okay, and remember, it wasn't until 1899 that Voorheesville became officially an incorporated village. We're going to cross the street here. Okay, now Windlespecks Grove is going to be almost behind the current fire department on the opposite side of the creek. Okay, it was where Windows Specs Grove was The railroads had made Voorheesville blossom into a tourist area, business area. The village actually, by 1900, the village actually had three major hotels. This being the least major of the three hotels. This hotel had um, rooming at the second level. They had uh, beverage on the lower level and food uh, and that was about all that this hotel that this hotel could offer but and it was the, lo the lower of the uh, hotels my history tells me that in Vor that in this area many many people rented their homes and that there were hot, uh, like B for like B&B &B type things during the summer because even the hotels could not house all of the people that wished to come to Worriesville. Worriesville was a very popular getaway, summer retreat. Uh, there were the Heldeberg Mountains, the Indian Ladder Trail, uh, the swimming areas. Uh, and when we see the Grove Hotel was the Cadillac of hotels here by, the, by 1900. And it offered amazing things and we'll also see another hotel which is called Harris House which is more close to the center of town okay this would later be um, they actually called it Brookview uh, Hotel and then later was bought out by the Smith family and the Smith family made it into a tavern uh, in the my uh, the, the tavern at that time again everybody here called it Smitty's there were two Frank Smiths, the original Frank and his wife, uh, Lil, uh, ran it. My father was drafted into the service for World War II. He praised Mrs. Smith, Lil Smith, as being the mother of Voorheesville because he said, and there are copies of these letters at the uh, Historical Society and the Voorheesville Public Library has a whole Smith file up there that you can look at by inquiry, you have to inquire and make an appointment to see it. 
but she wrote a letter, I believe, every week, Dad said, to every member of the man who was in the service during World War II, and she listed all of the guys that she had gotten letters back from, what they were doing, where they were, what was going on in town, and he was very taken by her tribute that she paid to the service people. They, that family started making pizzas, I can't remember when, but they, my mother said she started getting some kind of a Bisquick mix or something and started making <laughs> pizzas. And apparently they had one of the only TVs in Voorhees because they, my mom said, they used to, she and my father used to come here on Friday nights to see the Friday night fights on TV. <laughs> building that was his maintenance that's what the building looked like that's this was where you got your car serviced and I believe this also before before one of the additions on the school over here that this became um, that this became uh, they actually had the uh, shop classes in this building here were held in this building. Um, Clayton Bowton, one of the fathers of the school district, part of the school is named Clayton A. Well, when I went there, it was named Clayton A. Bowton Junior Senior High School. That school opened in 1959, okay? And Clayton Bowton came to Voorheesville in 1921. In those days, you didn't need a big degree, you needed a two-year degree. At a normal school, that was the normal way of getting an education to become a teacher. Uh, Clayton Bowden had gone to school at St. Lawrence University, so he had a four-year degree, so he was a big-time guy. He came here as a teacher, later became principal. In 1941, this officially became the Central School District of Voorheesville Central School District. The name of the town was voted on by the people of the area. There were actually three different names. I can't remember all of them. One was Heldeberg School. One was something else, which I can't remember, but the vote was Voorheesville School, and it became the Voorheesville Central School District. In 1959, also, the New Salem School was closed. It came here, and there was a school in New Scotland uh, an elementary school where the town hall is, that was once another of the New Scotland schools. layout they were very economically laid out they weren't very big but they were affordable and you could have three bedrooms and raise a family pretty well street in Murraysville that area was developed all those ranches in there off of Pine Street were developed right after the war and you can see a really good example of the 50s uh, ranch houses my elementary school best friend Sandy Thielander's house. I used to come here every day. <laughs> Didn't know until later that, that that building in the back uh, originally, well, I think Home Economics would have been, and okay. Home Affairs may have been in that, and also I think the original first kindergarten was in that, was housed in that building before there was an official area for that in the school. That was, those like shop and Home Economics and kindergarten didn't get added on to the school until after um, this, the next addition was put on there. Originally that brick, that big brick building came in the 30, in 1930. It had 17 rooms and it also had an exciting thing. They had a theater gymnasium combination, which was one of the first in the state of New York. That building was visited constantly 
by people from all, by educators from all over the state of New York because it was a state-of-the-art building. People came all from all over to see that 17-room building. The father of Morrisville's High School, I guess, uh, Clayton Fountain. An interesting anecdote that Clayton told during he was became principal. He was a teacher, became principal, and a and origin and ultimately became superintendent of the district and at one of the uh, meetings that they had he told the story of how early in his career on a halloween evening he was in his odd house and behind the behind his house and a bunch of kids came and turned over the odd house on him oh. <laughs> what's a grange uh rural agriculture association Location? No, association for oh, farmers. Oh, I see. So, okay. A group that works together. This originally, uh, the house was owned by the Darlings. He was a lawyer, I believe, and he was the village clerk and attorney. And in 1904, his wife started a um, organization called the Bayview Club, which was a very high ritzy thing where they used to um, get together once a month and discuss esoteric things like Russian literature and Russian and other stuff. And every month they had a different topic and all the members of the Bayview Club were expected to produce a, some sort of a document researched uh, over the course of the month and present and be able to present and talk to it. So this was the Bayview Club and it was, um, I believe the central Bayview was located in Detroit, Michigan, uh, the central, I never heard of that. yeah, and that was in the early 1900s here. This is the site of the original, I don't know if this was Terwilliger built it or not, but the Steverson family which took over the Terwilliger farm which was the orchard and uh, the dairy farm. The original house sat right here where these uh, senior living places are now, condos, I guess. And the barns were all in the back along the creek. Ice harvesting was a big uh, industry during the 1800s. Ice was harvested off of the creek here in this area and there were several locations that ice could be sold um, in the village. There was, so I don't forget to tell you, right behind uh, this area uh, where the old library used to be, when I tell you about that, behind it was an ice place where they sold ice. There was a building there that you could buy ice out of uh, during the 1800s. The ice For your ice box. They kept, they, what they did is they isolated it in the darkness and they kept it as long as they could. Yeah, and they, they packed, yeah, it was all packed in hay, hay. Yeah, well, same difference. Across the street was Voorheesville's first bakery. Okay, uh, 1894, uh, Orf became Orf White. He started baking in this house, both the Seversons would deliver milk to your house. We all had a little uh, aluminum box and we would put, and it was bottled and it had about three inches of cream on top. My grandmother had a little ladle thing. She'd stick in there and take all the cream off and she'd use it to make whipped cream and other specialties for her baking. Okay, we get pasteurized milk. They delivered it daily to your door. You would leave your bottles in the box and whatever, however many bottles you put in the box, they would replace and they'd give you a bill and you'd put your, actually would put your money right in the box for your uh, weekly, uh, whatever you owed. Mrs. Severson told me that they used to peddle milk. She called it peddling milk. Oh, right, exactly. And how hard it was in the winter to get up some of the driveways and I can see it now when I look at those. Well, the bakery, Orfoid's bakery, started baking and they would also deliver they would also deliver to your door now the interesting story about the bakery is Orf white starts the bakery in this house and it's not 
he doesn't have the space or the ability to have an oven. So he goes next door and they allowed him to put the oven, uh, to put the oven in the basement. So he was actually having his bakery here, but he was baking his stuff over here in this house. <laughs> it's across the street. The original building, which you can see if you follow the roof from the front to where it ends, the first part ends in the back, the original bell tower. This is the uh, Methodist church. In 1815, Methodism officially, I guess, becomes to Voorheesville for this area. It was called the Black Creek Methodist Society in 1815. Uh, check my notes on uh, 1824, somewhere between 1824 and 1828. The original section of this church was built. However, the interesting part of it is it was not on this location. That church was built on Altamont Road. If you drive up Altamont Road, as soon as you go past the fire department and turn off left to go to Altamont Road, look quickly to your right. There is a marker there that shows, that tells you where the original Methodist church was. There's also a cemetery that is still located in there, which was original. In 1890, this church was disassembled, rolled, brought, I don't know, down here and put onto this location, okay? Uh, it has since been added on to, um, uh, I think it's been added on to a couple of times, um, the social hall. In the 1950s and 60s, when I was younger, every church community in this area had a dinner during the course of the season, a very large, a large production. Someone would have a roast beef dinner, one would have a turkey dinner, one would have a spaghetti dinner, those were the Catholics. And, and uh, everyone attended, the, I mean, it was a large population. Politicians would come from all over the place to be seen to, so that they could campaign and that sort of. Sam Stratton, I can remember seeing Sam Stratton everywhere. I'll tell you a little bit more. Okay, again, Methodism, in the early days was the primary um, primary religion of the area. Clayton Bowden was a staunch um, a staunch Methodist. It is I have had people tell me, okay, that Clayton Bowden was very big on Methodism. As a matter of fact, they told me one of the early teachers that came here, uh, was Catholic and she came on the train she had been hired apparently remotely and when she showed up and Clayton found out he said well you can become a Methodist or you can get back on the train <laughs> and uh, she became a Methodist and I remember the lady and she was a, a devout Methodist until she passed away and she taught it was also told to me by other folks that Clayton Bowden did not hire a Catholic to work in his school district until 1955, okay? Uh, Thomas Baker and the Farrells, if anyone remembers the Farrells, um, were the first Catholics to ever work in the school district. Thomas Baker, the music teacher? There were two doctors, resident doctors. They lived right here in the village, and they were just general practitioners. You could go and see them. This was the office of one of them. Was it Dr. Graff? Case. No, before him. Oh, I don't know that. All right. It was Casey was here. In yeah, Casey came in the 50s because my father was assessor for the town of New Scotland. And I remember Dr. Casey coming around 1955 or 56 after graduating from uh, medical school here in Albany. He came to inquire. He was from Del Mar and he came to inquire about my, to my father about opening a practice here because he was going to buy this out from the doctor that was actually here. I, I think the name of the doctor before that was Dr. Graff. Then down in the village, another we had another doctor um, that was named Dr. Sutherland, but he was in the village proper. And in the 50s and 60s, we had two, two doctors right here in town that wow. you could see quite easily. Dr. Casey practiced, I believe, until he was about 80 years old. He was real young when he started. Yes, he was just out of, just out of school. But Dr. Casey remained on the staff of the medical college for many, 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 many years afterwards. Yeah. The street was not a real park 
when when we were young, when Brenda and I were young, it was just an open space. Um, it became Hotelling Park uh, later in time uh, after George Hotelling, who was a superintendent of public works here in town for years and years and years, and a very dear man who did a lot for kids and other people in the, in the uh, area. This be uh, became Hotelling Park probably maybe in the 90s. Yeah. Several people, the monument over there where the decorations are is a monument to the fallen soldiers in Voorheesville from World War II. The Lockwood family had two brothers that were actually killed during World War II. Uh, I think there were seven or eight members. And that monument used to be down farther in the village. 1987, the village was pretty populated. Again, the village came from the railroad and built out from the railroad, okay? You gotta think of it in that. In 1887, the Methodists got apparently their first live-in pastor and they built this uh, parsonage. This is the parsonage. And by 1888, they were living in this parsonage, which is the reason that the Methodist Church was moved from its original location down here uh, because the Methodists decided that the church needed to be near the parsonage, which needed to be more in the central uh, location of the quote unquote village proper. Building across the street, which is probably one of the most uh, interesting buildings in the village. The best I can find is that this building was built somewhere between 1900 and 1925. A very distinguished businessman, I believe his name was, his name was Bunk, but I think it was Oscar Bunk, lived in this building. He ran a grist mill down in the village, which was enormous, which we will show you the site when we get there. His son, George Vunk, became, became a mayor of the village of Worriesville. He lived in this house with his family. Um, then it became the Meisenheimer house, and then it was built, or it was bought by Riley and Son and turned into a funeral home. When I was a boy, this fancy building was called the Mayor's Mansion because Mr. Vunk lived here. So we used to re refer to it unofficially as the Mayor's Mansion. The park belonged to the belonged to the Vunk family and then it was do donated to the village or whatever. Is possibly the oldest, this is the oldest house in Gorysville. It has been remodeled and changed over time. Uh, dates back to 1810. Our village historian, Dennis Sullivan, who wrote the book I refer to constantly, currently lives in this house and has been living here since he moved to the area. So this is the oldest house, it's approximately 1810. Across the street, let's see, one, two, three doors down from the Methodist church, there's a sign and the sign tells you that in 1787, there was a grist mill located over here. Now 1787 is actually two years before the US Constitution. So you can see, I don't think, there's no evidence that there was a house there, but it was a grist mill there. And it also later turned into a carding mill. Okay. What's a grist mill? Grist is... Green. And it was it was developed because of the they could use the water power on the tree. And then when it turned into a carding fan, uh, mill, the carding is wool where they make the wool stuff. <laughs> All examples of the older dwellings were probably pushing 200 years on a lot of these buildings, if not already there. is trying to restore one of the original barns here. Positive in what this looked like, but in 1895, the first telephone lines were brought into the village area. And according to uh, approximately 19, 
17. In this building across the street, uh, maybe that building or something on that property became the telephone exchange. Uh, when I was a boy, we had to, you had to pick up the phone and go, Alice, would you die a la la la? And a lot of the, uh, a lot of the lines were party lines too. So you could also pick up the phone and someone else may be talking on the phone because two or three families would share one line. So you had to wait till they got off. So ho you hopefully had uh, people on your line that weren't too verbose. So. <laughs> the gentleman that owns Riley and Son, this is, this is the son of the original Riley. And now he and his sons run and his wife all run the Riley funeral home. This began, but somewhere, this used to be the original village park where the monument to the World War II factory was located. There was also a house over here originally, which is no longer around. And the monument used to be right here. And on Memorial Day, we would have a parade down through the village. We would stop here. The veterans would present a wreath at the monument and then a select guard would actually fire a salute, a uh, three or four shot salute to the veterans. And it was very, uh, very uh, interesting and dramatic. Funeral parlor, not the first funeral parlor in Gorysville. Then Riley and Son. This was a funeral parlor, it's now a uh, apartment. Very important. In 1902, the Horriesville Hose Company was established. And in 1911, this building was built. Downstairs, there was just one area. They had their push cart thing that they did for their fire company. Okay. That was down on the lower level. Up in the left-hand window, at one point, was the Voorheesville Public Library. Wow. Okay, on the right-hand side window was the Voorheesville Savings and Loan Association. Okay, that is not the first location, however, of the library. Now, let me figure, I think it's either the second or third location of the Voorheesville Public Library, okay? say it now while we're here this is was originally the masonic temple it was built in 1908 this building was all the masonic temple on the area at the top not i'm sorry this was odd fellows hall i'm sorry um, this was odd fellows hall which is like the masons it was an organization like the masons a brotherhood based on faith and they had up on the roof. I'm not sure of all of the the, in, the intricate, I don't know the secrets and everything of it, but they had a temple on top, I have seen it. And they had all kinds of rituals and things that they went through uh, on there. I would say that the building became the Voyager American Legion sometime between 1945 after the war and 1950. My father was a um, charter member of the Voyager American Legion after he returned from service in 45. So somewhere between 45 and 50, I would say this became the, uh, right, the, the Voyager Legion, American Legion. This place was very important to Voorheesville because it was able to provide many things. They had theater in here, the first Baseball, uh, basketball game was performed in the village here at this, but apparently the uh, Odd Fellows didn't like them playing basketball in the building. So not only was tourism important in Voorheesville, but sports were very important in Voorheesville. There is in, in 1914, there is evidence that there was a professional basketball team and a professional baseball team, and one of the teams actually won a championship. It was not unlikely to have 500 to 1,000 people viewing a baseball game in town. Down in town where the laundromat is, there was 
a, a house there or a building there that was called the Voorheesville Athletic Association. Okay, the Voorheesville Athletic Association. There's a story of how they played on the second floor and uh, it was not uncommon for disputes or fisticuffs to break out during a game. And apparently one of the fans actually fell through the floor in the <laughs> building. When we were, when Brendan and I were kids and the American Legion owned the place, for 25 cents on Saturday night, they put in a uh, movie theater. They had a per big projector and up where the state, there were vaudeville, no, not vaudeville. Yeah, actually, they vaudeville was here, but they used to do, uh, what were the blackface things called? Minstrel, Minstrel shows show? were performed here for years. Uh, in the American Legion uh, and we could go for when we were kids for 25 cents you could go in there and they'd give you a ticket for the Saturday night movie and you'd get a red cushion to put on your hard chair. That's right. <laughs> in 9th when when Catholics first came to the village, they were apparently required to go to one of the two churches that were already available, the Methodist Church and the Presbyterian Church, which we're going to pass shortly. In 1916, my family, the Italians, the Polish, and a few Irish decided that it was time for a church to be built. They started a building fund. Prior to that time, the Voorheesville Athletic Association allowed Catholics to meet in their building and a, a priest from St. Lucy's Church in Altamont would come down uh, and say a service there. In 1916, the building fund was able to fund the church on the hill. This was the first church I was probably, I know I was baptized in this church. If you look carefully at the steeple, you can actually see from this location and from the picture that Colleen's passing around, that there, the Wellman family donated the steeple. And the Wellman family had clocks arranged on the steeple. You can actually see one of the remaining clocks on my right. There's a clock on that side, there's a clock facing that way, and there's a clock facing that way. You will notice there is no clock facing this way, because when Mr. Wellman gave the money to the village, since the Protestants of the neighborhood did not really respect, weren't very respectful to the Catholics in the area, he told them that he was not going to give them the time of day. <laughs> of Albright's Butcher Shop, which was the first, I guess, butcher shop in all of, in uh, Voorheesville. Um, this butcher shop turned into, when we were kids, this was the main drugstore in town. It was Johnny Heller's Drugstore. The front part of the store was his drugstore, and he had various other things you could purchase. In the back of the store was a soda fountain. It was really neat. And you know, I don't know if you guys remember those little stools that had the red thing on the seat and they spun around. Well, there was a there was a counter back there with those little stools and things and you could go in there and order ice cream or get an ice cream soda. And spin around, which was the best part of the deal. Dennis, do you know of this street, Main Street and uh, this street, um, which one was the oldest street? Which one, where did it what was the first row? Do you know? I don't know. All I can tell you is this was probably original because, again, you have to remember that the village expanded outward from the train station. So there might have okay? been a little on each one. Exactly. I'm sure all of these were basically just dirt paths, okay? And in the, originally in the 1800s, it was horse and buggy. There were before I forget, there were actually two um, blacksmiths in Voorheesville at the, uh, early in the 1800s, yeah. okay? Historic crossing when the two went in. This, when I was a kid, this was a, this actually was a department store 
Mr. Nautic owned this department store and we used to buy, we used to call it, we used to call him No Tick because his name is N-O-T-I-C-K-S. <laughs> so it was Nautic store, but we kids always referred to him as Mr. No Tick. <laughs> and we could buy our gym suits and stuff in here. They had dry goods. You know, they had everything from candy to dry goods. You could buy material for, for making clothes. And you could also buy already fabricated shirts and pants and that kind of stuff in Nautic's department store. Um, at one point, the village had four had four grocery stores, not like the Hannaford, okay? These were small, uh, privately owned groceries. I remember Ricky's. Okay, and the Ricky's are my, my grandmother was a Ricky, so oh, I am okay. a Ricky, okay? They were one of the four uh, stores that were grocery stores in town. I guess at this point, it's also a good time to tell you about industries, just to tell you about after the railroads came, Voorheesville had a canning factory, a cannery, okay, somewhere in that location around the railroad. They had a cigar making industry here. It didn't last long, but there was cigar making. There were actually two ironworks in the village. One burned down and the other one stayed until it went out of business. There was a shirt and collar and buttonholes uh, store, hardware, hay, coal, all that kind of stuff was sold right here in this area and location. There were two blacksmiths, hay and straw, coal, lumber, uh, feed and grist mills, um, cider and vinegar works, uh, much hardware, and as I told you, ice industry also, there was a lot of work with ice um, and probably several other things that I'm not remembering to tell you about. But there was a lot of commerce commerce in the area because of the railroad. The railroads, the railroads picked up and dropped off products. When did that end? It probably ended, well, the cider mill went out of the cider mill went out of business in 1954. They moved to Utica because my father was a shop steward at that and they offered him to move to Utica. And he said he didn't want to leave his family. So he stayed here in Warriorsville and was unemployed for a while. Actually, he was waxing cars at Dom Torx gas station for quite a while until he got a... So with all that going on... <laughs> there must have been one. That has never been disclosed to me. <laughs> in, a, in a proper town which was very religious, and the founding fathers of the town were very religious people, particularly Protestants. So I got a feeling that there was probably some of that going along, but it was a well-kept secret. It was hushed. My grandmother was a Meth my grandmother was a Methodist, and she always used to say, you know, the Methodists play cards, but they always pull their grapes. <laughs> I don't remember that actually. Well, the big... call me a bird just before I moved here. It's possible. Now, I'm not sure you, you're saying the same thing or not, but I'll tell you. You're on Voice Avenue? Yeah, well, no, it's on, uh, it's on um, Grove Street. Right I'll tell you about it here in a second. The building was built as the Presbyterian Church. This was the Presbyterian Church. It was Warriorsville's second religious um, sect in the, in the village. It would become the library. It was the Warriorsville Public Library uh, for many, 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 many moons. And the library today, where it is located, moved from this location to the location it is at now, which I think is their fifth or sixth location within the village of Warriorsville. Again, back at the firehouse was the second location, I think. This house was my grandmother's, my grandmother's brother lived in this house. My grandfather's sister lived in this house. I don't know if this is an interesting story. I don't know if you want to know about me or the history of Warriorsville, but anyway, my grandfather was working in Pennsylvania in the early 1900s. 
in 19, somewhere around 1909, he went back to Italy to San Marco de Gavote and said, I want a wife. And the Ricky family fixed him up with a 19-year-old girl, my grandmother, Grazia Giuliano, Grazia Ricci. And they got married in 1909 in Italy, got on a boat, and in New Year's Eve 1910, came to, Vor not to Voorheesville, but they came to New York, I believe, went to Pennsylvania. Um, their first children were born in Pennsylvania, and in 1913, they came to Voorheesville. And uh, because I, uh, my grandmother's family, a guy by the name of Mike, Michele Ricci, was working on the railroad, and he was getting their family members jobs on the railroad as laborers. And it's really interesting because my grandmother was a Ricky, my grandfather was a Giuliano. My grandfather's sister was also fixed up with a Ricky. So the Rickies and the Julianos had two people married yeah. back and forth across. And this was where my, uh, my, grandmother's, my grandmother's brother and my grandfather's sister lived here in Voorheesville also. And again, they had two or three of each side living here in the village. And I lived there. And you lived there once too. Did they build a house? I don't think they built this house. Okay. The ice, one of the ice houses, one of the ice houses was located behind the Presbyterian Church. Up that street and across. Okay, and that's called Pleasant Street, which is also known as High Street. I guess that's unofficial. Yeah. Yeah, and you could get a really nice look at the village. Somebody had a picture on Facebook a, little, a couple weeks ago facing down from up there that it was taken years and years ago, which yeah. was really nice. And it all, I think it had in the picture a picture of a water tower which was on the uh, railroad because originally there were steam engines, so you had to have water for the original funeral home in Voorheesville. Oh, okay. one. This one right here, 31, 31. Do you know what it's called? No, I don't really, I don't think. Eighteen ninety-five. Charles Lloyd ran it. Oh. In here, it also fits into my family because Charles Fields bought this building in Altamont for $1,000. And he had it, and Charles was married to my father's cousin, um, which is Ricky. And <laughs> yeah. he brought this building down here, had it taken, brought down here from Altamont, and it was put on this property. I think it was added on to, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's been added on to. And the left hand door was Charlie Fields' barbershop, and the right hand door was the Voorheesville Post Office. Yeah, I still remember this building being trucked or brought down from Altima. He paid a thousand dollars for the building. I don't know if we have a picture of this, but this was when I was a kid. This was Vunk's feed mill. Uh, I think they were actually Perina dog chow, but the history goes back that this was originally a grist mill. It was an enormous construction. Okay, a big, big building, hmm. and in the fifties. The thing burned down. It was a huge all alarm fire. This thing burned. I can still remember the uh, sirens going off. We had fire companies from Albany and all over the place putting this fire out. I'm not sure exactly the date of that, but I was born in 1950, so I had to be four or five or some years old uh, to remember all of this going on. George Vunk built the, the mill back up again, but it burned again. Shortly, within at least five years of that, it burned again, and it was totaled. And after that, he never rebuilt the service. But trains used to come in and out of here uh, for all kinds of pet foods and stuff. Uh, brought in stuff, took out stuff. Um, it was a big business, big operation in Voorheesville. Oh. After Voorheesville Savings and Loan was in the firehouse. This was, when I was a kid, this was Voorheesville Savings and Loan. This was their big building. This is where my parents had their mortgage and my mother used to walk up Voorheesville Avenue 
once a week or once a month. I can't remember which because I'd come with her. And she'd pay her mortgage off here because they spent $2,300 for their house on Voorheesville Avenue. <laughs> this is the second doctor in Voorheesville. This was Dr. Sutherland's place. His office was right here under the porch, from behind the porch there. That was his office there. Dr. Sutherland was a character for a doctor. I think he smoked cigarettes 24 hours a day. And he was so overweight that his eyes bugged out. But he was an exceptional nice man. And his son, Donald Sutherland Jr., was my best friend all through high school. Grocery stores, when I was a kid, it was pretty small. And eventually, or at some point, one of my grandfather, my grandmother's sisters and her family was upstairs. I just went out of business as Phillips Hardware. Uh, that has been hay, coal, hay, coal, lumber, was once Badgley's Hardware, then it became Cornell's Hardware, and the Cornell family still lives in town, the Badgley, one of the Badgley ladies still lives in town, but she has a different name at this point. Uh, so there was big industry in this area. Somewhere in this area, the Voorheesville Athletic Club was also located somewhere around. these places are going around. The fact that sports were enormous in Voorheesville. Somewhere, I believe in 1914, um, the basketball team had a, had a Obviously not a big professional like the NBA or anything like that, but they had a basketball pro team here and they were champ league champions at one point. And uh, people came to see those games. Where on, Main, on South Main Street, there was a creamery located here also. Okay, after the railroads came, there was a creamery here, which did big business. Grocery stores, it was originally owned by the Swift family. It was originally owned by the Swift family. Then it was bought out by my family, which is the Ricky family. It became Ricky's Market. I believe, I got a feeling that the grandfather Ricky was Michele Ricci. I theorized that he was the railroader that worked on the railroad that brought my grandfather and many of the Ricky family to Voorheesville to work on the railroad. The son, Charles Rickey, was my grandmother's, um, my grandmother's brother. He had a butcher shop and mar meat market here in this building and also in Altima because he taught my father when my father got out of high school how to be a butcher and my father ran the butcher shop in Altima for many years and that's how he met my mother who was working for the doctor in Altima. So this was Swift and Rickey's um, meat market and grocery and the Ricky family kept this you may have known young Mike Ricky who passed away just a year or so ago and he ran this uh, for many many years oh uh, it was Grand Union yeah I think I think he worked at Grand Union Yes, he did. Market or uh, he worked at a lot of meat markets around. He actually worked at the one down at uh, uh, New Scotland near Stonewell for a while, and then he came up. All right, this location here, the Joslin family was very big in Voorheesville. As a matter of fact, they owned the property um, where Scotch Pine Drive is now. They actually sold that property to the developer that built in there. The Joslins ran a hardware store here. There was also a shirt and buttonhole collar place in this location here. Uh, early in the days of the village. Um, when I was younger, Schultz has had an appliance store in this in this building too. So this is and this now we're looking at the village proper. This is where the village started extending out from. The location where that car is turning all around this area to the railroad tracks was the original village square. This is where parades would start and stop. I might as well tell you the story I read in Dennis Sullivan's book. In 1893, there was a, a 4th of July celebration here in Voorheesville. At that time, Voorheesville had, according to Dennis, approximately 300 residents. 
um, uh, at the parade, the parade numbered between two and 3,000 visitors who had come to Voorheesville to view the parade, participate in all of the activities that took place. They had races for children. They had all kinds of athletic events. There was baseball game behind the Grove Hotel, which had a beautiful baseball park, among other things. And they had evening fireworks. Now, I don't know if you can believe this. You know where the tennis courts are in Voorheesville? Right back here where we came by. In the 50s, when I was young, on our Memorial Day parade in the evening, we had fireworks there. The fireworks were right along the railroad tracks. We would stand up on the top of the hill and watch all the fireworks over the, over the village. This building here might have been the first grocery store in Voorheesville. This is a very old building. It's been added on to what is the original, it's one of the original freight houses for the railroad. That building right there, which is now Lyons Construction Company. I think it's been added on to. Okay. Voorheesville, I told you, had three hotels. The Cadillac, Gold Medal Hotel is located over where the pavilion is now in the shape of the original railroad station. That was uh, Friars Grove Hotel. That place was a showtime center. They had, I believe, 50 rooms. The Grove in the back was had a reputation for being immaculately kept up. People came out here to get married. There were, there's talk of thousands of people like teachers associations and other business associations would come by train to stay at the Grove Hotel to have their conventions and conferences. Also in the summer, tourists from all over Albany and around surrounding areas would come to the station which was located over in that area. The Grove was the Cadillac of hotels. This you are looking at was the second elegant hotel in Voorheesville. It was called Harris House. Harris House had beverage, they had food, they had vaudeville-like acts, singing, music. It was a place that people like to come to, okay? Um, there was my father used to tell me that each of the towns and local localities would have uh, things like they would sponsor a boxer. And a lot of the taverns had their own fighter that they would um, promote. And each of they'd go to each other's place and they'd fight it out. And there would be lots of betting and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, it was another of the sporting activities of Warriorsville. Along the track, Didn't Mikey Michaels have this. Like Mike, Mike Michaels, another nice yes. Wow. Mike Michaels was married into the Ricky family, and he owned this as a tavern. And his family actually lived upstairs after it became here after it was Harris House. And he ran the tavern here for years, and then he turned it into an ice cream yeah, we shop. We played the softball team out here in 1960. I never heard of Boris. <laughs> and I'm in here and they have a pool table when you walk right in. Yeah, and then a train went by and I couldn't figure out what's going on there. Here, there was an original ice cream shop somewhere in here. Also, somewhere along the railroad tracks, with all of these rest, um, big time hotels and everything here in the central location, a man by the name of Al Borscht decided it was time for Voorheesville to have a restaurant that was not a hotel. It was just a family restaurant where you could come and get real food or regular food. And he built the restaurant in this area, um, which is called Al Borst's Restaurant, somewhere in the 1890s, I guess. And you could just go there and get something. But the interesting part about Al Borst's Restaurant was the Joslins who had a hardware here were very big time people in the area. And the jo Mr. Joslin decided that we needed to have a library. And the first library that Mr. Joslin sponsored was located in Al Borst's restaurant. 
So that was the first library. Okay, the second library. Oh, and I also forgot to tell you, in the apartment building that's halfway down Main Street on the left, there's an apartment building. The last door on the on the left was also the Roosevelt Public Library. <laughs> so the, the library has been moving around Voorheesville for many years. Okay, and that is at least the fifth location of the library where it is today. Dennis, is that unique to have that building built like yes. that? Is there anything here that forced it to be that way? I don't know. If it, I have no knowledge as to why it was shaped yes. in that flat iron type shape. Yes. But you know in New York City there's several buildings. Uh, Alonzo Voorhees built his house in 1867. Alonzo Voorhees only lasted in Voorheesville in that residence four years. Four years, okay? However, there is tale of that 1893 celebration I told you about. He was a major speaker at that uh, uh, 4th of July celebration. He built this house in 1867, and that location, it lasted until then. After he left, it became a boarding house. After he left, it became a boarding house. Now, the interesting thing is, in 1868, he established the Voorheesville Post Office. And up until 1890, let me check my notes here. Yeah, 1890, some guy in Slingerlands by the name of Dudley Farland was a railroad freight guy and apparently he had been in the railroad freight business for eons or something. And for some reason, to honor him, they changed the name of the Voorheesville Post Office to Farland. It was known as the Farland Post Office and in the book that Dennis has read, you can actually see a couple of letters or things that are um, addressed to somebody in Farland. Yeah. And the book is available online at the PDF through the library website. Through the library website? Yep. And it's also available through the library and it's also available at the Historic Society, I guess for a fundraiser or whatever. Um, so Voorheesville was known as Farland for a couple of years uh, from 1890 to 1892. And then again, you remember 1899, Voorheesville becomes the incorporated village of Voorheesville officially. Foundry Road, you'll never guess why it's called Foundry Road, because at the end of the Foundry Road was Albany Castings Company, which actually had another name prior to that. They made ironworks. It was an ironworks down there. Uh, it lasted probably into the 60s, and then it was, uh, it went out of business. Down between Pine Street on Voorheesville Avenue, where the rail trail is, there was another foundry there before this one, and that foundry uh, burned down, and it was never replaced, but a, this, I guess, foundry down here took the place. So that was a big industry here in Voorheesville. They called Spaghetti Lane at one point. My family my family lived down there, <laughs> along with the, Lent, the Lentleys and other Italians. That, my family, my Italian family that came to Voorheesville were basically peasants. My grandmother and grandfather did not read or write, but they were totally self-sufficient. They had a half acre of land that they developed for food, that they grew their own food. Each of the Italian families, many of the Italian families had an outdoor oven where they baked. It was that they built. They had their own grapes. My grandma... Yes, right here in this country. Right here in this country. I, we, my grandmother grew grapes right on her property. In her basement, I probably is no longer there. In the left-hand corner, I still remember the grape where they stamped on the grapes and she made her own thing. My grandfather had a big uh, counter in the basement. We had kegs this tall, wooden kegs. He made his own wine every year. And there was always one that was tapped in the basement. My grandmother, I'd walk in and she'd go, we're going to have dentista. 
Go to the basement, get her the wine. He handed me the pitcher. In Italy, you did not drink the water. The water was contaminated. So consequently, you drank your own wine. Oh, and, they con and they continued that process traditionally. He also says that's why they drank beer in Germany. This hotel had a reputation for its elegance and for the beautiful grove that went beyond in the back. I re my father told me that there was a beautiful baseball park and that was originally where baseball was played in Voorheesville on the park behind there. The grove was supposedly elegantly upkept and people would come to spend time at the, at the uh, grove Weddings were extremely common at the Grove Hotel. It was uh, called Friar's Grove Hotel because Mr. Friar, a farmer and big shot in town, uh, sold the land to be uh, the hotel, or I guess started the hotel. Um, there was a racetrack in the back for horses, for horse racing. This was a real... Um, upscale. It, it was a resort. It was yeah. a very upscale... Well, it was, stories say that it was no uh, surprise to have a thousand people here for conventions and, and other things. So Voorheesville was, and again, they had three hotels with lots of entertainment and uh, all kinds of things going on. Uh, it also was, I think, sometimes called the Wedding Hotel. The shops must have done well there. The station was located right in this triangular area right here. Somebody told me that, I think it was Colleen had read somewhere that the they stopped passenger service in 1930. Not true. I personally took the train from Voorheesville with my grandmother from Voorheesville to uh, Albany. I personally rode that train many times from here during the 50s to go downtown to shop. So it was still operating early in the 50s, I know that. Where did you come into downtown? Union Station, which is now a bank, yeah. owned by a bank. You don't have to worry about parking or not. I, and I also went to my grandmother's cousin in Altamont on this train, so I know, I know the train was working, doing that. The train went all the way to Oneonta, this, this line, not that line. This line went west, which is the one that's now the rail trail. That line went from Albany and it went west. I know it went to Oneonta because my other grandfather on my other side of the family worked for that railroad. He was stationed in um, Central Bridge and then later he was at the Roundhouse in, uh, in um, Oneonta. So, and that went, I think it went even farther west. So I know it went through uh, Binghamton and probably farther west. The railroad once had us. The railroad once had a siding that came off from the main tracks and went down here and crossed the street because it went over into the cider mill, which was, when I was a boy, it was called, at one point, I guess it was Empire Cider Mill, and when I was a boy, it was called Duffy Mott, which was the father of Mott's apple juice. They made vinegar and cider and other things here at the place. It was enormous. I don't know, do we have a picture? There's a picture of, yeah, there's a picture of it. So please take a look at that. We're going to be passing it. We're going to be passing it on our left as we go down the rail trail. Look out for bicycles. Yeah. Oh, and then it became Duffy Mott Cider Mill. It was a big time affair here in the village. Actually, there was another cider mill in this, lo in this area. But it was, you know where the light is at the end of Voorheesville Avenue by Johnston mm -hmm. Road? Mm -hmm. That area, there was one uh, off to the left there. There was another cider mill there. Back on Foundry Road, at the end of Foundry Road, somewhere in that location there, there was a canning factory also. And you can see everything was kind of pushed in around the railroad area. The building, 
the building that has been put up over there um, to begin the rail trail, the top roof of that building is in the same silhouette as the original uh, railroad station here in town that has the same roof design. It's in the same shape. The tower was located somewhere up in this area. And at one point, at one point in the 50s, maybe early 60s, there was a cement works here also. Yes. On that side of the railroad track. Spider Mill was located here, which became Duffy Mott. It took up all the area here, went pretty far back, deeply that way, and it went all the way to the end of this of Grove Street. And if I remember by the time I get there, I'm getting old. The uh, there is part of the original building is still there, but the rest of it has all been torn down to my knowledge. But one of the later parts was built, it was all a concrete building, and it was the offices, the administrative offices. And that's still there, but is now, I believe, a storage house. A pair of, located approximately right here, where the trains would back up to the uh, mill, and they would deliver and pick up uh, vinegar, and cider that was produced here and take it on to other locations. And I used to come up, I used to live on Boardsville Avenue when I was a kid and I would come up here sometimes with my mother because she'd bring my father his lunch and we, dad and I would sit on the loading dock and have lunch together out on the... <laughs> of the original cider mill, this right here, this big thing. This was all made out of concrete block. This was all made out of concrete block, and I believe it was the administrative offices. It's still in existence. It's been upgraded by the people that bought it out, and I think you can rent storage area in it. There was a foundry right here at one point that burned down. I think now, I'm, I don't have the ver total verification on this, but if you head down Boresville Avenue and go one, two, three houses, there's a big white house that used to be a farm. And I think that was Friar, the original Friar house that gave the, owned all this land in the Friar farm. That, careful for the bikes that um, sold the land or, or began began the land, uh, began the Grove Hotel, because it was originally called Friar. And I think the original Friar farm is, farmhouse is still located several. Hey, how are you? Yeah. Where the story I don't know that. I can't confirm that he was related because he moved here. He was not originally of Orangeville and Dick Friday. Roadways now in the 1800s were probably just dirt paths because there were, I have read of places, liveries where you could rent and find carriages and horses in town. My class, graduating class, and we went to school all, all through. So this was not always a car a wash place. If the Ravens Way family lived here, I think and I remember Rich getting in one of those awards very bright. I also understand that Honest Mike, who if you ever knew him, you would never believe this, but Honest Mike was a gr college graduate. And he ran this store, looked like crazy, used to take all these beat up old cars, fix up these old cars, and put them out here for sale. We had, we had a driver ed instructor, Harold Mead, who was a lifetime resident of Voorheesville, and also, and also an athlete in all of the activities around Voorheesville. He was a character, Coach Mead. And he used to tell a story of, all right, you, in driver ed class, you go, all right, you guys, 
You know, you can buy a used car from Honest Mike. You get the Honest Mike warranty. That's 500 miles, or if you can get it off the parking lot. <laughs> Altamont Road, and we had just got a new driver in, my friend Jeff, and we had a three-speed on the column, and we took off from the curb, and Jeff's going through the gears, and he's watching his hands, and the car's going farther and far left, and there's a dump truck coming down the street, and we're headed right at it. Coach Road reaches over, grabs the wheel, pulls us over to the side of the street, opens the door, gets up, puts his foot out, and he looks at Jeff and he says, when you see me do this, you know you're on your own. <laughs>